Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the risk of starting a new tradition at GSD by beginning on time, uh, let us do just that. Uh, my name is Rick Pizer. I'm uh, the director of the Real Estate Academic Initiative uh, at Harvard, a uh, professor here in the Design School, and uh, we are thrilled to be able to host today's uh, program uh, uh, featuring uh, Gerald Hines and uh, members of uh, Cesar Pelli's firm. Uh, um, uh, regrettably, uh, Caesar himself is, is ill today, but uh, the firm is uh, very well represented by uh, Caesar's partner in charge of the project you'll be hearing about today, uh, Greg. So, um, uh, Jerry, as almost everyone in the room knows, is uh, considered to be one of the top uh, developers in the world. Uh, since the firm's inception in 1957, they've developed almost uh, a thousand projects in 17 countries uh, covering all product types. Uh, with more than 330 million square feet and assets valued at almost $23 billion. Uh, uh, many of our students uh, participate in the Heinz competition. Uh, uh, Jerry received the Urban Land Institute's uh, first J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development. He then donated the prize money plus a significant additional contribution to create the ULI competition in urban design that bears his name. Um, just an ad, Harvard routinely has at least 10 teams competing and it has either won the competition or placed in it, uh, I believe six out of the 10 years that it's been operating and we expect to win again this year. <laughs> As a native Houstonian, I have known of Jerry uh, my entire life and I actually worked for him in my first job after graduate school. Yeah, he's been a mentor and friend for many years and has always responded positively to my request to come speak. I admit to shamelessly taking advantage of the fact that his granddaughter, Laura Hines, is currently a student at HBS to lure him here to GSD to accept our offer to become uh, GSD's first executive in residence. Uh, this is the first of four visits he will make to campus over the next year and a half. I, I was uh, pleased to note on his bio uh, uh, on the Hines website, which uh, is extremely short, but uh, the last sentence reads, uh, Mr. Hines has championed and supported real estate architecture and urban planning programs at Harvard, Yale, and Rice Universities, and the College of Architecture at the University of Houston is named in his honor. While our efforts to build a real estate program at Harvard is still a work in progress, uh, Jerry supported the GSD and uh, the Real Estate Academic Initiative uh, has, is greatly appreciated. Uh, let me uh, introduce the other panelists uh, as well, and then we'll jump into the program. Uh, Jay Wiper is Managing Director of Heinz Europe and is uh, uh, Heinz UK Country Head. Um, he's the Managing uh, Director of Projects in the Europe and East Asia region and was the partner in charge of Porta Nuovo, which is today's uh, project. Uh, he's also uh, been director in Spain and uh, uh, previously uh, worked on Peachtree Tower in Atlanta and uh, 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 as all Bostonians will appreciate the uh, Boston Red Sox facility in Fort Myers among many other projects. Um, we regret that Caesar uh, got sick at the last minute. Uh, um, I, I uh, should have realized that uh, Caesar uh, worked for Aereo Saarinen and, uh, among other things, uh, worked on the TWA terminal at JFK Airport and the Morrison Stiles Colleges at Yale University, where uh, he was, uh, uh, became dean of the architecture school there and where his firm is still housed. Uh, uh, in addition to winning many awards, uh, Mr. Pelly was awarded the Aga Khan Award for architecture for the design of the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. And finally, representing uh, uh, the uh, firm uh, now known as Pelly Clark Pelly Architects is Greg Jones, who is the partner in charge of the project that we are seeing today, uh, Porto Nuovo Garibaldi. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he has worked on uh, the Mori Towers in Tokyo, the NTT corporate headquarters and showroom also in, in Tokyo, and many other projects. Uh, uh, so, without further ado, let me turn things over to Jerry, and let's plunge right in. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Rick. Uh, one of the things that our firm has been dedicated to is to create outstanding architecture 
in real estate developments. Why do we do that? Well, we think it's for reduction of risk. And reduction of risk is that we have a building that we think will penetrate the market easier and faster against our competition if we have outstanding design. But you've got to have outstanding design at a cost. <clears throat> and we try to keep our cost maximum, not more than 2% of our competitors. <clears throat> what that does is that hopefully our buildings and competing will be the last to lose occupancy of a tenant and the first to gain them. What that does in the yield curve is increase our yield on that investment and also have a safer position against a failure of the project. So we're the, the last to lose a tenant, the first to gain them, and so we get better financing from the banks because they feel it's a safer project. It's also that we get long-term financing and equity better than so that our equity participants, because we can't raise all the equity ourselves, we have to have outside people that contribute. And if we make it safer for them, and that we've shown over the record, we are much more advanced in raising that equity. So we'll show you a little on this project, which again, Americans coming into Milan to do the biggest project in Europe, wow, that's, some, that's a challenge. And so it takes the cooperation of the city, that means the political establishment, the architect, and the organization that you put in place. And so these, the mayor was very supportive. And what we had, and we'll look at, go ahead with the slides. We have a site that we tried to acquire that was some, is some 800 meters long and when you look at it in comparison to the Domo and the other major parts of Milan, this is a huge site. It was vacant because no one could pull these 20 to 25 owners together. 40 years the city had been trying to put it together and we had this wonderful man, Ricardo Catella, who sat with these grandmothers and got an option on all 20 pieces of land because we couldn't have a, a, a single holdout and got an option to where we could close and on, on that development. But it shows you what an immense piece of land in downtown Milan, adjacent to two major rail and centers that served Milan. Can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> there we see the site, and there's three actual projects there. And, but it's some 800 meters. That is a long way from the station to the center of town. And that's all connected through a park. <clears throat> go ahead. And Jay, why don't you go ahead and explain. Jay was intimately involved at my side and helped lead this project through some very torturous uh, positions of land acquisition. And the, the Stucca was a one holdout that we had the left party in possession. We had their office there and we got permission from the city to evacuate it at seven o'clock in the morning and the police came in, evicted all the tramps and dope pushers and uh, we secured the site. So we had a lot of 
interesting problems. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. As you can see here, that there are actually three sites. The site that's surrounded in red is known as the Garibaldi site. The site surrounded in yellow is the Verazine site. And the site surrounded in green is Esau. And I'll take you through each one of those in just a minute to give you an idea. But in total, it's over 70 acres of land in the middle of one of the major cities in Europe. And as Jerry said, it had been sitting fallow for 40 years for about uh, three primary reasons. One was the fractured ownership that Jerry mentioned. You had ownership by the state government, known as the Regione, the municipal government or the city government, as well as 20 private landowners. And for 40 years, you'd never been able to get the different seats of government to communicate and cooperate, nor could you get the individual property owners to work together. And we came up with a concept for how to overcome that, and that's what really made this project possible. The city, the project, if the Duomo is the center of Milan, the site is only a kilometer to the north. It's in walking distance. Um, and as Jerry said, probably most important from a commercial standpoint, it sits on the confluence of all of the major public transportation, whether it be rail, subway, tram, or bus. And that's really what made the site work very well for us. We ended up being able to put together Again, 3.1 million square feet, 70 acres. Um, and this is a view of what the master plan would look like at night. <clears throat> and in fact, we're able to get over a period of years working with three different master planning firms, including Pelly, the uh, ability to build 6 million square feet. Now, given the fact it's a very urban site, almost half of that square footage is below ground. It's not all basement space. You actually use the first level below ground for retail and services as a way to maximize your buildability. The numbers, no matter how you look at them, are large, whether you're looking at the total land area, the amount of public space that's being provided, um, the number of uh, the, the magnitude of the overall investment at the bottom. Um, and we ended up with a team of about three dozen people that have been working on this. Uh, Greg and I started in 2003. So, uh, and we, we're gonna, about to start delivering buildings, and we'll bu deliver buildings through 2013. It gives you an idea of the scale and effort. So how did we go about this from an urban planning standpoint? We had a, a, an area of land that needed to be brought together. Um, interestingly, under the Beres early Berlusconi years, uh, he did encourage the different seats of government to work together. And really, with that thrust, we were able to get the regional and the municipal headquarters people to come together. We proposed something that had never been done before, which was to actually combine public and private ownership and then reallocate it in a more logical basis on a master plan. And that allowed us to, on the left-hand side, were uh, a sort of a color chart of 20 different landowners. Uh, and on the right-hand side is a final master plan that, sh that ends up with separated public and private ownership, where the, the region of Lombardy ended up with a new site for their headquarters. And they did an international competition that um, Pay Cobb Freed won. And the, that building is now finished and owned. The city of Milan ended up with a singular site for their new headquarters yet to be built. And Heinz ended up with three sites that, that are the result of the three projects we're talking about today. And in the middle, all of the remaining space in the middle was contributed to be what will be the third largest public park in Milan. So it ends up with something that worked very well for everybody. So this is the Garibaldi site. In the upper right-hand corner is the actual form of the Pay Cobb design of the new headquarters. Uh, halfway down on the right-hand side is the site for the new regional headquarters. In the middle is the park, and on the left-hand side, the sort of question mark shape row of buildings is the master plan, which Greg will take you through shortly when we move into actually the master plan and design segment. On the Verizine site, um, this was interestingly a, a site where our acquisition process, which had been almost four years on the Garibaldi site, was almost instantaneous because we bought the site. But the prior landowner and the seller went through a 10-year legal battle, including going all the way to the Italian Supreme Court. Uh, to get his building rights verified and be in a position where it had commercial value. And as soon as that, uh, that decision was announced, we bought the site. And the Verizine site, again, uh, was a situation where the prior owner, who it was a developer, was caught in a combination of claims and lawsuits by the neighboring residential neighborhood that froze his planning rights and he couldn't move forward. And we took a risk and bought the site from him and then 
went through a community design process to redesign the site in a way that the local co surrounding community was willing to accept. Um, and that's the background on putting together those three sites. So what does it look like when you put it on a simple bar chart? You can see that it's 12 years start to finish. Uh, in fact, the, the origins of the concept started in 2001. Um, the Garibaldi has a very long site assembly. The uh, Verizina and Isola sites, because we bought the sites, were much shorter. Um, and you can see that about half the time frame is related to actual building the buildings, the construction and delivery segment, and the other half is related to design and getting planning permissions. Much like Boston, the planning permission process is pretty complicated. So we now have assembled the largest site in Europe. The, the dilemma we had was there had been nothing there for 40 years. How do you describe to the community what you're doing? How do you name the project? How do you brand the project? How do you create an identity for something that's never existed? And so we took on a program of looking at overall branding. And what we ended up, we had three separate projects. Those three separate projects had separate equity investors, separate banks, all of whom wanted their own identity and their own dignity. And yet to the community at large, it was a 70-acre singular site in the middle of their city. So we had to work on it from a branding and positioning standpoint of how do you combine the two. So we ended up in the upper left-hand corner coming up with what we call an umbrella brand, which is Porta Nova, which relates to the history of the gate system. Milan was a walled city that had gates that people came into. Uh, and actually, the shape in gray is the shape of the, uh, of the Porta Nova gate. And the green relates to sustainability, which is something I'll talk about, which is a very big hallmark of the Heinz firm. And so that's the modern. That's the future. So it's the historical and the future. On the lower left-hand side, we retain the dignity of the three sites. So they each have their own individual identities on a site-specific basis. And then because almost half of the buildability is residential, and that's something where you need, a, again, a very se separate type of identity than you do from commercial space, we created an entire separate residential company called Residencia Fortanova. <coughs> and then we name every one of the buildings, because if you're buying a flat in a building, you want to have an identity for that building as well as an address. So you have another layer of, of branding and identity. And on the office building, we created a separate business district. Um, and all of those, much the way you do in Boston, where you name the building after the street address, most of those buildings have an identity that relates to their physical location. You then roll all that out. So on the upper right-hand corner, you see site fences. The first thing we did was to surround the sites with very high-quality sites that had rotating graphic standards that began to identify, even before we were done designing buildings, began to identify the sites to the community. So when people heard Porta Nova, they knew where it was in the city. And that was a year before we had designs. <clears throat> we then came up with an entire branding and visioning concept for the residential and a whole set of branding materials that go from brochures and models and taking it all the way through. Ha then having assembled the site and assembled the brand, we then turned to the actual design side of it. And again, we had three separate projects with different partners. We brought on three top firms to be our master planners. Um, and as Greg will show you shortly, he'll take you through the Garibaldi project. But once we had the master plans in place, we had to go through and look at what was the, the mixed-use componentry of the designs. And it's interesting. This is really a singular project by Heinz as the master developer being built all at the same time. And yet, the, the pr three projects are very different. Garibaldi, which sits almost on top of the major rail station and subway, is heavily a commercial office-oriented scheme but it also connects to one of the top retail streets in Milan called Corso Como, so it has a significant amount of retail. Verazine, which is a block away from the railroad stations, has really two faces. One face that goes onto a major commercial street, that's all office. The other face, the south-facing face, looks over the city and much more low-rise residential buildings, that's residential. So Verazine ended up being about half and half. And Isola to the north is part of a old, established, working-class neighborhood, and that therefore is almost entirely residential. So again, you really look back to the context of where you're building and you get clues for what the highest and best use could be based on what exists. And then we get into individual building designs and on these three projects together we have 21 different design architects that we're working with, um, all the related engineers, all the related specialty consultants, all being done at the same time over this 12 year period. <clears throat> The buildings are not the only thing that's important. We believe that the public spaces between the buildings have to be just as good as the buildings themselves. A lot of times, if you think about great cities and great spaces you walk into, it's the space, it's the void space between the buildings that really makes it special. And so we put together an entire separate design team led by a gentleman by the name of Jan Gale, 
And Jan has a sociological practice where he goes in and critiques public spaces that don't work. We said to Jan, we love what you do, but we're going to make you sit at the table with us, roll up your sleeves, and actually design a great space from scratch. And so Jan, we said to Jan, you're not allowed to look above three meters. You can't look at any of the buildings. You have to be the passionate protector of the public space. So in Greg's case, when Greg was working on the master plan of the Garibaldi project, Jan and his team was working on the public spaces, trying to make sure that all the dimensions became human scale, even though the spaces are quite large. It's also, here's the 800 meters that Jerry talked about. Uh, if you take it back to what people in Milan think about on the right-hand slide, if you walk from one end of the Piazza del Duomo all the way down the shopping street to the Piazza San Babila, that's a, that's a stretch of walking distance that people in Milan do all the time. And that's probably one of the largest pedestrian stretches in the entire city, and that's what we're recreating. In Milan, in addition to giving impact fees and job creation fees the way you do in Boston, when you get a building permit, you also contribute public buildings and gift them back to the city. So on our three projects, we're actually creating and gifting four public buildings as part of the process. As part of having the municipality and the region as part of our partners in Garibaldi, we end up with the new seat of government as part of the overall project. And by the combination of the mixed use that I just showed you, we've got a higher concentration of Class A office space in one location that previously existed in Milan to the point now where if you go and talk to the real estate brokers, Porta Nova is a new sub-market, an office district in the city. So we've changed the way the city is looked at from an office standpoint with that concentration, and we also will have the largest concentration of high-rise residential buildings that has existed before in Milan. So a total change in the skyline as well as the density. And to serve both the residential and commercial tenants, you need to provide services. And so we have over a half a million square feet of residential services, some which are restaurants and, and services related to office tenants and other which are large grocery stores and other things that are related to residences as well as high fashion because we're so close to the Corso Como area. The final thing I'd like to talk to you a little bit was, goes back to that green leaf that was on the original diagram. I'm sure everybody in this program has been uh, well indoctrinated with sustainability and what the background and history is. We tend to look at it in a diagram, and I don't have time to take you through it, but <clears throat> this is really taking the, the overlapping leaves. Sometimes you, this is labeled as people, profit, and planet. And it looks at how, in fact, a good sustainable real estate project touches all those areas. It has to work for the community in which it's built in. It has to work from an ecology and design and construction. It also has to work economically for the sponsor. In the U.S., you have a fairly simple system because you have the United States Green Building Council lead program and the Energy, Pro Energy Department's Energy Star. But in Europe, where we spend a lot of our time, every one of the countries has a different program. And you have to use the appropriate program in the different area. So BREAM, which is in the U.K., is also a project that we took to Russia and very well accepted in the Russian background. DGNB is a brand new German standard. HQE is the French standard. There are standards in almost every one of the continents, uh, and you have to decide how you're going to approach it. Uh, Heinz is a huge supporter of the LEED and Energy Star program, have been recognized by both as being um, partners of the year for them. And it is really something that, I, I will say it, sustainability is in the DNA of our company. It's in the D DNA of the gentleman sitting next to me who began his career as a mechanical engineer and constantly challenges us to find energy efficiency and technology changes in every building we do. And so we made the decision in Milan to import the LEED program. We actually went through the process of translating all of the LEED standards into Italian, finding all the local regulations that met, and Porta Nova is a pilot project for LEED, the first LEED project in Italy. And we established the LEED Gold as our standard for all of the buildings. And so that is what we gave to Caesar and Greg and asked them to go forward on. Greg, would you take us through the... Is that mic live? Because it's brutal at this angle here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That. You want the pointer? Uh, first one's the clicker? Yep, first one up. Here we go. This is a, uh, a macro view of Milan, just oh, to sort of. Microphone. 
This is a macro view of the lawn, just to show you the basic positioning. Up closer. All right. <laughs> this is a macro view of Milan. <laughs> And it shows the location of the project that we just spoke about. This shows the, uh, the site outline. And one of the things you'll notice immediately is for as large an urban design project as this is, it involved frighteningly little demolition. The entire site is practically vacant. It's one of the first things you notice when you look at the site. Here's looking uh, west. Here's looking uh, a little bit south and west. There's, there was no there there. But what was fascinating was how developed all of the edges were. And this was essentially a hole. This was the previous master plan. Let me do this. <laughs> no problem. This is the previous uh, Nicoline master plan in which its major contribution to it was the idea, actually let me go back one. The major contribution was the fact that it created a central park. Much of the other aspects about it really weren't uh, viable and had nothing to do with program. What this is, the, this is the very first sketch it did back in 2003, in which there are two really key issues at work here. The first of which is interconnectivity. The project, the project needs to be successful. It needs to intercommunicate to Corso Como. It needs to outreach to Isola, Verazine, the train station. And the other aspect about this, which was very important, is the creation of a space. To us, to me, what made the most sense was not to create a collection of buildings around an open space, but rather to create a public piazza and then compose buildings around it. And this shows the, the primary challenge in which Isola is six plus meters higher than the rest of Milan. And there was this incredible gulf and cleft. And that the public park was a full six meters taller than anything else to the south. This was one of the very basic master plan models in which it created the central piazza but the idea of you know, a, uh, a consummate Italian piazza is square, it's rectangular. To me, to us, what was important was that this piazza had an iconic quality and it had a quality in which every time you interconnected, every time you reached out, every time you approached it, you were always coming into the center. So picking a piazza that was sort of iconically omnidirectional seem to make the most sense from a master planning point of, point of view. This is uh, the final design. And what you can see here is the key issue of the once you create this urban piazza, it is, in fact, raised up off the city of Milan six meters. But it also happens to be completely coplanar with the park to the north. So the idea that this project had to be street level to the north, and it was six plus meters to the south, east, and west, all higher. We had to sort of reach out and bridge and reach out and negotiate, and the, prob the project comes down to the ground in very different ways in very different locations. This just shows you just a piece of what's going on. Greg, I think it's interesting there, in, to meet the parking requirements of the city of Milan, we would have had to produ produce three levels of parking below grade. But as you can see, the proximity to the tunnels, the, the subways are one of the greatest assets we have when the buildings are finished. They were greatest, one of the greatest challenges we had when the assets were under construction. And so Greg's team said, why don't we just lift most of the parking above grade and therefore create a bridge between the elevation of the park on the north and with a sloping ramp and stairs connect back into the city on the south. And that really was one of the key decisions that Pelly came up with as a way to solve the challenge. It took something that was, a, quite frankly, a liability of this site and turn it into a positive. The idea of this central piazza that has this extraordinary multiplicity of interconnectivity and how you take that basic idea, that basic organizing strategy, and 
you compose it on top of this, <laughs> which is not one, not two, not three, four, five different subway rail station conduits all below grade at various different, different levels. This was the basic organi organiza or organizational plan, which is essentially, damn it, which is tower A, B, C. C becomes a portal towards Corso Como and the idea of the central piazza. Then the whole issue is how do you now take this diagram and now begin to compose it? Uh, our Chinese friends have some rules for how you go about uh, governing massing. Uh, in Japan, there's a two-hour two limit that uh, any commercial property can cast a shadow on a residential property. In Milan, our friends have what's called the 60-degree rule, is which you come up from the windowsill of someone's, of the nearest single-family residence, and you project up 60 degrees. And that begins to orchestrate what you can do and what you can't. So here you can see a situation where it's a non-issue. Here you can see an issue where we begin to kind of compose it in order to comply. And here you see a violation issue. So on every site that we look <clears throat> at, in, really in Europe, because every country has a form of light and air or 60-degree rules, we do a 60-degree diagram that establishes the envelope within which you can build without breaching the requirement. This does not mean you cannot breach it, but the minute you do, you subject yourself to claims. And those claims can be injunctable, which means they can effectively take away your building permit. <clears throat> they can freeze your building permit, which means you sit and wait till the courts make the decision, or their damages, in which case there's a calculation of damages based on the amount of light you have taken away from that particular unit or that particular building. So the basic composition in a mass from a massing point of view was to locate the residential properties as close to the adjacent residential community, make those the lowest. The next step up would be to the east to allow sunlight to come into the piazza. The next step would be to introduce the first tower as a portal in which you enter through it. It becomes a entrance facade. It would be fairly low, then comes a moderate height building. These are 12, 22, and 32. So it formed a fairly dynamic composition that sort of steps and spirals up, putting the tallest building to the north. So it always enabled the piazza to have the maximum amount of sunlight, and it put the highest element along the key axis. And this just shows the master plan culmination, which was, which was about a nine, ten month process. Uh, Heinz is to be really commended. Uh, we could have blown through this faster, but each and every step we took, we really were careful on the sizes and heights to really compose and to really study what's the, what's the best way to bring this kind of square footage on online in a city that doesn't have a lot of high rise history. And this is the, the basic master plan component, or the, uh, the composition. Uh, Jay spoke to you about, again, at the, at the absolute heart of this was the, was the idea of the Piazza Central Open Space. What we sort of took a, a real twist on it was is that it's really remarkably challenging to create a piazza that has the kind of life and energy that you'd want it to have. So what we tr decided to do collectively is to introduce a whole series of layers that this isn't just like a one note issue. And the idea of the introduction of water, the idea of introducing vegetation and landscaping to an Italian piazza is remarkably innovative. The idea of making the ground plane phenomenally rich in texture taking that edge and enlivening it with retail and then composing it in a remarkably three-dimensional interactive section. So this shows the central piazza and its access north, south, east, west. It is a remarkably permeable space, but yet the buildings contain it surprisingly well. <clears throat> The, one of the real challenges in the uh, 
building in Italy is that their fire department has an outstanding, powerful lobby. And they have a really curious series of rules which aren't at all up to date. But what it does do is that you have to ventilate the garage and you cannot account for any kind of mechanical supplementation. Sounds harmless, but this is what happens. <laughs> you get these extraordinary apertures, one, two, three, four, five, six. And how do you compose these things? Because these all have to be located specifically for not aesthetic reasons, but for practical ventilation ones. So the idea of taking the piazza and making it a water feature so that you really cannot engage these apertures and to then energize the perimeter and to create retail, a movement system along the canopy, uh, a seating area, and then people can move through, is to create an environment that really suits its needs. One of the real concerns we all had was that, you know, first and foremost, this is also a project. This is office buildings here and here. And at the 100 meter mark, which is about a soccer field, it really feels remarkably appropriate. But it was much too big a piazza. So on the piazza side, we introduced these low rise podiums, which then created much bigger retail spaces, allowed us to neck it all in. And we necked it in from the inner with the water feature and from the outer with the retail and the movement to come up with the with the right size kind of environment. Here you can see uh, Milan has quite a history of arcades. I thought it'd be much more interesting to make this a daylit arcade as opposed to one underneath a building footprint. So here you can see the public circulation, the ability for any of these tenants to come out and to create a much, much more smaller scale occupied space. Again, another movement zone, another yet another area for it to pause and reflect. And you get an idea of the sort of environment that we're trying to create at this remarkably unique water piazza. And this is how it looked about a month ago. We were actually testing the waterproofing, so you can see it was flooded. Um, this is a real tribute to our Heinz friends in which uh, the city had put forth an initiative and they capitalized on it and we introduced an extraordinary amount of solar voltaic and they got a credit for the FAR, but it wasn't all that much. But I think it is a remarkable uh, enrichment to the, uh, to the design itself. This uh, shows you the canopy as it spills out in each of these apertures between the buildings. So you get this phenomenal kind of welcoming interactivity from inside the piazza to its announcement along the Milan street. Uh, here we show that uh, the, as there's actually a degree of interactivity in which uh, the water can actually spill down into these openings. So we try to make these openings a design feature as opposed to just some ventilation shaft that was just uh, totally unintentional. The project is remarkably three-dimensionally in in intricate. We have parking levels, ventilation, retail access, access from the trains up to the piazza, down from the piazza. The retail can extend down as well as up. It's a very three-dimensionally rich sectional environment. This is a view from the piazza looking down into the uh, project itself. This is the lower piazza. There is a whole other piazza underneath the upper piazza. This one's enclosed and the other one is obviously exterior. And this shows you what one of these fairly utilitarian ventilation shafts look like now. But uh, very soon it'll look like this. This shows that one of the major interconnectivities was between the piazza and the rail station, which is, this is like the LaGuardia of train stations and the Centralia is like the JFK of train, train stations. This will have a huge commuter input. 
This shows the interconnection to the rail station. And again, it shows you the remarkably uh, complex interconnectivity and levels between the piazza, the parking, the train station, and street level. This image of the, of the major building. Yeah, this is one of the, excuse me? This is one of the key connections from the piazza to the Corso Como. This was one of the major pedestrian links which really was also critical because that was the one of the ways to, to go from six meters above ground back down to ground. This was the way to negotiate to people naturally in this very restaurant, bar rich environment, just retail, just up this net, very gentle slope, and suddenly you're at the park level and the piazza level. And this is how it will look. And again, it shows you how these projects are all dancing around these multiplicity of below grade subways and train stations. This shows you the Tower C entrance portal. This is yet another connection in which it shows you that it's not just one connection, but the fact that the project opens itself repeatedly for streets, for sidewalks, and other sidewalks. The issue was to create as much interconnectivity between this project and the neighborhood. And that's what this will look like. We get to the design of the major building and the smoking balconies, and then we need to leave room for questions. We're about out of time. Here we go, Tower A. That was just six months worth of work we just blew through there. <laughs> <laughs> Here you see the stepping, cascading, massing strategy for towers A, B, and C. And one of the things in Europe, not nearly as strong here in the U.S., is the issue of daylight and occupancy and restrictions. Our German friends have a remarkably prescriptive rule system. Our Italians also have theirs. And while at the same time we had to maximize, you know, it's, it's all about the view. So here the idea is, is a tower of this unusual narrow least depth by U.S. standards is 18, 19 meters. But because of the daylight penetration, this is all the maximum that we could introduce. This just shows you as an interesting example, what Jay was talking about earlier. So this is a typical building we did with Heinz in Houston at 25,000 square feet per floor. This is the Tower A, which is about 15 or 16,000 square feet. And you can see it's a very different animal. It's this is definitely an office building, but it is very different from what we're used to. And the idea of taking the core and pushing it to the back to concentrate on the ability to create much, much better lease steps. One of the things that we wrestled with very early on, and it was very exciting, was to take the idea that was contained in their zoning, which was that outdoor balconies don't necessarily count as FAR or square footage, or in their case, they call it SLP. And what this does is it enables you to then create a, certainly a leasing asset, this office or this office, he, he or she has access to an outdoor balcony. But I was far more intrigued with the ability that what it does do is it allows you to completely disengage the outboard wall from the rest of the tower. And you get to create this remarkably unique kind of sale-like opportunity in which the boundaries of the wall really have nothing, are not subtended to the boundaries of the occupiable space. And it really creates a very interesting opportunity architecturally to create an inner, expre an inner expression and a very, very different outer expression. And this just shows you Tower A the inboard side facing south with a great deal of sunshades, the outboard side facing north, remarkably taut, but the ability that this wall has been disengaged from the architecture allows us to take something that was an interesting zoning anomaly and create it into a leasing opportunity as well as a, as well as a, a design feature. And from an economic standpoint, because those don't count as FAR, they're effectively free space. We pay the contractor to build them 
but they don't count against us. And in Milan, you can typically rent balcony space, certainly from a residential standpoint, at 50% of interior space. I think in Milan, you on office buildings, it's sort of 30 to 50%. So it creates some real value if you can figure out a way to incorporate it into the architecture and make it really useful. Greg, I think this shows what excites me about this project, that sail-like quality. And I just finished building a great sailboat, and I <laughs> love the looks you know of this sales. building. <laughs> so, Greg, I think we need to wind it up, and they only have 15 instead of 20 minutes of questions. Well. So wind it up. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the culmination of this uh, cascading uh, spiral composition, which is the spire. And the spire was intended to anchor the project to give it a presence on the skyline of Milan. And it was also meant to create a new front door for the project and to the park. This is a couple of weeks ago, our helicopter friends dropped the spire on top and it became the tallest building in Milan, actually in, in, in all of Italy. Okay, I think we need to give them time for their questions. Greg? Any thoughts? <laughs> we just blew through seven years' worth of work in uh, about 18 minutes, so. <laughs> Thank you. You can tell who's really in charge of it. No. <laughs> Jerry, I'd like to start with the first question. Is it true that you lose interest in projects uh, the day they start construction? What's that? Is it true that you lose interest in projects the day they start construction? Oh, no. That's an unfair question. <laughs> I'm very involved in the leasing and the getting the projects to an economic and positive value. And that's very challenging now that we leased one million square feet to the largest bank in Italy, Unicredito, and their bonds, their debt just became declared junk. So we've got a, some interesting challenges ahead of us. Let's take some questions from the floor. Yes, please. That's, this is this is clearly a, a really once in a lifetime opportunity to to create this kind of space in 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 the city. How does Heinz from from Houston or Heinz Europe from London find that there is this opportunity in a place like Milan? How do you come to opportunities like that? Well, <clears throat> we had an an Italian operation that was in being. And we had built one or two, wasn't it? Two. One or two projects. And Ricardo Catella, who's a wonderful man, and his son is now in charge. He passed away with cancer. But he's the one that assembled this. They had the idea to try to assemble that site. And we have people on the ground throughout in Germany, Poland, Russia, Spain, France, UK, so, and Germany. So we have teams that are there that run that country and they're looking for, for projects or creating the ideas for projects. It doesn't just drop out of the sky. I can tell you that. It's a lot of hard work. Other questions? Yes. So I, no, okay. So I have a question about the uh, the planning process. I was wondering um, if you can tell us a little bit about um, how the community was involved in the entire planning process. How the what? The community, the local community, or, or the city communities were. Jay, why don't you take that one? Okay, Jerry. Um, each of the three projects was a bit different. Um, the planning process is not unlike the planning process uh, in Boston where you have the BRA. Um, you go through an architectural review committee, uh, you, so you have to basically get the architecture, the scale, the materials, 
the detailing uh, approved at, on an architectural side, and then you have your traditional technical review, whether it's fire or all the various departments that have to sign off on it. But on the, on the front design, anytime you get a project of this scale, whether legally it is or not, it becomes a public-private partnership. If you don't have the community and the municipality, the political side, to working together with you, you'll never get through it because there are so many obstacles along the way. So we were very fortunate to have uh, a mayor, actually in Milan, unfortunately they, the governments turn over on a pretty regular basis, so we're now on our second mayor, but they recognized that bringing foreign direct investment into their city was a huge value, and having an upgraded commercial sector would bring new companies in who would create more jobs. And so I think if you properly present the opportunity of the project from a municipal, st municipal standpoint, whether it's jobs or tax monies, et cetera, you can build that consensus. But they want to make sure that when you're doing the master plan and the design, you're listening to the community. So we do a lot of community workshops. Uh, we do a lot of community presentations. Um, Greg did a lot of, on Garibaldi. I would say that was much more commercial because it was sitting basically in an area that was had had no buildings on it before, whereas in the other side, the Isola neighborhood was in the middle of a very traditional left side uh, working class neighborhood. They were very involved in their community. We did church presentations. We did church suppers. We did community presentations. We did workshops. Um, all of that to try to engage the community and try to avoid claims at the point you got your building permit by somebody who didn't feel they'd been included or didn't have a voice. It's no exaggeration. There were literally the hundreds piece. of meetings. There were literally hundreds of meetings over that six, seven year process. There are actually meetings still happening today. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, was there ever a point during the process where you regretted becoming involved with this project at all? We had a lot of we had a lot of problems with that Steca. I wasn't sure <laughs> that we would ever get those people out because we had the party of the left that had their headquarters in the Steca, and uh, <clears throat> and you have the left and the right. The right was in today. The left is in, but you have to contend with that in Europe. One of the more colorful chapters. <laughs> Other questions? With such a huge project, was there any sense within the city that you were taking a lot of the business interest away from the established places already? Established. I, I think established business. I, I think the city recognized that um, much of the central core of Milan is very antiquated, out-of-date stock. And if they wanted to attract 20th century <coughs> commercial companies in, they had to provide modern space. And if you get into the situation more typically in the U.S., which is you build the new buildings outside of the central business district, and then you have to put in all the infrastructure to serve them. In major cities in Europe, the, the municipality's goal is to try to keep that density, keep it where the infrastructure has already been built, and move people in. And so the city was not at all concerned with that. As a matter of fact, it was really the opposite. They were much more the promoters of that area. They were, they were surprisingly receptive because you can either grow vert uh, – horizontally or you can grow vertically and I think they really really realize that uh, optimizing the infrastructure and transportation that they had was far more preferable than building something way out in the burbs and then having to deal with it. At we actually competed for Unicredito with a suburban site that was probably 60 percent of the cost of our site, but because in Europe, when you move your location, if you move to a suburban site and it costs your employees more money and time to get there, you have to compensate those employees. And that came to a huge number for the bank. So to locate in a downtown area that already had the transportation built in, we had a big advantage. We'd, it would be something that we would like to see in our American cities, and you wouldn't have the suburban sprawl that we have. But they do have that in Europe, and it's a major factor in a company's location, whether it be Paris, Madrid, Berlin, Frankfurt, those are all considerations 
and very similar laws apply. Unit credit is actually moving from 21 different buildings in Milan into the three towers that Caesar Pelli and Greg designed. To, to that end, at, at what point during this entire timeline do you really start to go after leases? And when do you see the project from that standpoint stabilizing? As soon as you have drawings that are of a quality that you can convince somebody that there's going to be starts building, real like, quick. Start <laughs> very quick. <laughs> Building's not stabilized until the lease is signed. So that can be a short period or a long period. It probably took us a year to go through the lease negotiations with the unit credit, but recognizing it was a corporate headquarters move and it was a million square feet, that's not unusual. On that Jay, you might tell them a little about your mortgage uh, negotiations on our construction loan and some of the things that the number of banks that you brought together on that? Well, we had, as we said, we had three separate projects, and each of those projects have different equity investors and different banks. Uh, in total, we've put together a, a, a three consortiums of, of banks, and, and it's about 1.6 billion euros of debt financing. So one of the larger loans, certainly real estate loans, in the, in, in the country of Italy today um, and it was too big for any one bank, so we had to put together a consortium of banks for each one of the loans. But to give you an example of how different things are then and now, when we did the Garibaldi loan, which was the first project we put together, um, we got a loan before we had a single building permit, and the, build, and the project, which is 2.4 million square feet, was 100% spec. And we were able to get a bank to come to the table and give us a 70% loan-to-cost bank loan. Um, obviously, you would never achieve anything close to that today. <coughs> Question in the back. Uh, thank you. Um, you're basically going to uh, from vacant land to 6 m million square foot, and uh, the city probably has some limitation in terms of infrastructure. How do you deal with utility infrastructure that was existing? Does it... Do they meet the needs of the new structure, or do they do, 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 did you need to plan for it and, pl and pay for it? Um, uh, qu quite frankly, that location sitting on top of the greatest combination of public infrastructure and public uh, transportation was one of the great solutions to that issue. On the, on the infrastructure side, we will end up having invested close to 100 million euros in what I'll call public infrastructure. Now, that includes those four public buildings that we're gifting back to the city, the huge, the third largest public park in Milan. But we also went in and had to upgrade all the electrical substations in that area. We had to relocate a bus station and build a new bus station in another part of the city and move the bus station before we could get the area. If you go back to Greg's original picture of, of what aerial shot of what the site looked like before we went there, we actually had a major four-lane road cutting through the middle of the Garibaldi site. We had to physically move that road once to get access to the area the road was to do decontamination of the soil and get it up to specs and then move it a second time to go back to the permanent location and then build a bridge over it so that we could have the, the, the gradual grade ch transfer up six meters. So um, yes, you go in and you look at everything. We do traffic studies, we do soil studies, we look at the electrical, water, sewer, all the various infrastructure and typically you have to invest off-site to upgrade the municipal infrastructure to support your level of development. For the first two years, uh, they were in the aqueduct and um, tunnel building business. <laughs> I, think we, I think we relocated something like a kilometer and a half of high-pressure gas lines off the site in order to start excavation. Okay. Could you elaborate on the joint venture, public-private joint venture structure? To what extent that's the contribution from the public side? Um, let's just take the Garibaldi side because that's the most mixed. Um, you know, the great solution to that challenge to, in order to, to activate that site was to get the, the region and the city government to agree, which had never been done in Italy before, to con effectively contribute, combine their, their own building rights with private building rights, and then to create a public master plan, which is the Nicolini plan that Greg showed you, um, and basically pour or reallocate all those rights so that the region had rights in one location, the city in one location, the private in one location, everything that was left over became public and became the park. What that meant was that all the public infrastructure on that Garibaldi project that had to be invested had to be invested pro rata. And so we actually had to set up a separate company 
to do the infrastructure. And I think in total, Heinz and our partners contributed about 60% of that. And the region and the municip municipality contributed about 20% each. But we actually set up a company where we were publicly bidding roadworks um, using the EU competition rules. And then the money was flowing into a common pot. And then we actually went out and used public bidding side to, to execute those projects. And it's something that we found in Milan does quite a bit. Um, if you have to do in, in in Boston, you provide impact fees, which are based on the on the number of square feet of construction you do, and that goes into the community pot to be used for a variety of public projects. In Milan, they take it a step further, which is they look at areas around the city where they need things done, and they typically recognize the public process is more efficient than the private process. But if we give them the money, then they have to spend it in a particular way in a public bid process. So instead, what they do is they sit down and they say, we need a park done over here. And here's the design of the park, and we'll value it together. And then instead of giving us that amount of money as impact fees, you actually design, build the park, and gift it back to us. And so they get the efficiency of the private process. And in the end, they get the same product that they wanted, but typically are saving 20% in that process. We have time for one final question. Back here. Hello. Uh, can you explain a little further uh, what provision was made for to make this more of a mixed-income development? Uh, does Milan have anything like... Uh, inclusionary zoning or anything to provide um, uh, mixed or lower income units? They do. Um, all of the European community have uh, social housing requirements, and those housing requirements can be done and can be solved in a number of different ways. And on each project, it was different. So um, on the Garibaldi project, most of the, the money that was going to be spent in social housing was in those lower blocks that were um, to the south side. Um, in the Verizine project, I think the, the, there was a uh, financial contribution because the site was so constrained. And on the Isola project, um, again, we didn't have a chance to get into the design of that project, but the northern edge of that project, which faces onto the existing buildings, existing working class neighborhood, all of that row of buildings are um, fixed income housing. And again, it's done not, not unlike what it's done here, where you design the building to a particular specification. <clears throat> when you have your, your certificate of occupancy, the municipality then basically gives you your buyers. So ba they basically have a separate system where they go through and vet the buyers to make sure they meet all the requirements of income. And then through a lottery system or whatever the process happens to be in that municipality, they come back and give you the occupants for that building. So each project was handled a little bit differently. We unfortunately have students who have classes, so uh, there are two more opportunities to get to hear from uh, the group. Uh, the first is a master class uh, featuring students from the Weissman, Freddy, Xi Ping, and John Hong's uh, studios. This will take place today uh, from 2.30 to 4 in the porticos, and then this evening at 6 o'clock uh, there will be a presentation uh, led by uh, Mr. Hines and Jay focusing on all the development aspects of Puerto Nuovo and anything else you want to ask. And that will take place in Gun Hall, uh, room 111. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being here and for giving us unique insight into an incredible project. <laughs> and lastly, to Jerry for keeping us on time. <laughs> thank you.